do you care about wireless security? Why is wireless security an important topic? You all know the situation when you're traveling around for project meetings or conferences. Imagine several collaborations where researchers work together on specific topics in the area of network and service management, like in Flamingo. They meet at several locations of their partner universities. Nowadays, you can find everywhere a possibility to connect to the Internet. Since more and more devices are equipped with a wireless interface, this is possible without any additional hardware involved. You can get connected with your mobile, your Blackberry, your laptop, or your tablet device everywhere. Almost all public available devices are equipped with an interface which allow a connection to wireless networks. Therefore, several standards exist to allow an interaction between different manufacturers. The most popular standard is IEEE 802.11 with its specifications A, B, G, N. Besides these, there exist standards like Hyperland 1 and Hyperland 2, Home RF, or Bluetooth, where only the latter one is important today in transferring less amount of data. Now let's think about the security in such a network where no physical security is possible. Imagine the following scenario. A laptop or mobile tries to get connected to the internet via a wireless network. Do you see any attackers in this scenario? Have you ever thought about possible endangerments regarding the wireless connection? Do you know who can access the data which is transferred from your end device to whatever services you are using? Remember, none of the aforementioned standards except Bluetooth describes security aspects within a wireless network. Do you feel safe in this situation where an attacker plays man in the middle to catch your data, hack your bank account, or does other criminal activities? How to secure wireless connections? Security has long time been the trade-off within Wi-Fi. Early wireless networks leaned heavily on VPNs, virtual private networks, to provide a layer 3 security which left the IP network vulnerable to attacks. In addition, it introduces several challenges. The first to mention is roaming, where you travel with your connected device from one to another access point. Others are quality of service, client support, or simple scalability issues within this case. Therefore, security extensions were developed to allow the establishment of security mechanisms IEEE 802.11i D3.0 and IEEE 802.11i D9.0 are commonly known as Wi Fi. Protected Access WPA and Wi Fi Protected Access version 2, WPA2, the former security extension, Wired Equivalent Privacy, is still existing, but not secure nowadays. The WPA2 specification is a major improvement over WEP, which has the former security standards of IEEE's original 802.11. It was susceptible to attacks and poorly implemented by vendors. These weaknesses and the ease with which they have been exploited led to the 
6.11i standard, which was approved and published in 2004. The Wi-Fi Alliance created WPA as a subset of 802.11i and later WPA2, which provides stronger security than the first version of WPA. So, how does WPA and WPA2 work? WPA2 protects the network better because it is a layer 2 based, but WPA2 alone can't provide enterprise security. Most security concerns can be eliminated by combining WPA2 with IEEE 802.1x, a port-based authentication protocol for access control. Interference, rogues, and denial of service attacks are still possible, but at least a secure wireless communication can be ensured. WPA came with support for Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, TKIP, which uses RC4 cipher and can be implemented in software with just a driver or firmware update. Keys are rotated frequently, and the packet counter prevents packet replay or packet re-injection attacks. WPA provides integrity checking using message integrity code, MIC. Although this checksum method can be attacked with brute force methods, network traffic is halted automatically for a minute and the session keys are reset if a WPA-based access point detects more than one TKIP MIC failure within 60 seconds. WPA2 uses a new encryption method called counter mode with CBC MAC protocol CCMP, which is based on Advanced Encryption Standard AES, a stronger encryption algorithm than RC4. Both WPA and WPA2 include two authentication modes, Personal and Enterprise. WPA2 Personal generates a 256-bit key from a plain text passphrase, which is called pre-shared key, PSK. The PSK, in conjunction with the service set identifier and the SSID length form, the mathematical basis for the pairwise master key, PMK, that is used to initiate a four-way handshake and generate the pairwise transient key, also known as session key, between the wireless user device and the access point. Challenges in WPA2 personnel are the key distribution and maintenance. The authentication process leaves two considerations. The access point still needs to authenticate itself to the client and keys to encrypt the traffic need to be derived. The earlier EAP exchange or WPA2 PSK has provided the shared secret key PMK pairwise master key. This key is, however, designed to last the entire session and should be exposed as little as possible. Therefore, the four-way handshake is used to establish another key called the PTK pairwise transient key. The four-way handshake First message A from the authenticator to the supplicant. At starting state, no keys are known and therefore no message integrity code MIC can be computed. The authenticator 
uses this message only to send its value of a nonce to the supplicant. This message is sent without any protection. It is not encrypted and there is no MIC. This is the only key message that is ever sent without the MIC bit set to 1. If any of the fields in this first message is not set according to the standard, the supplicant should discard the message. The only fields which can be modified according to the standard are the replay counter or the anonce. Changing the replay counter can only result in a message rejection and is therefore pointless. Any changes to the anonce value will be recognized in message B because the temporal keys computed by the supplicant form the corrupted anon's value would be invalid. In such a case, message B would fail the MIC test and be discarded. The fact that message A is unprotected does not compromise security. Second message B from the supplicant to the authenticator. After successful delivery of the first message, the supplicant has a copy of anons and generates its own value of snons. It is then able to compute the transient key. Next, it prepares to send message B to the authenticator. This message contains an MIC value and thus proves that the supplicant knows the pairwise master key PMK. The fact that the descriptor type field is 1 indicates that the MIC value should be computed using an logarithm called HMACMD5, which produces a 16 byte. MIC value. The MIC calculation is performed over more than just message B. It includes all the bytes from EPOL protocol version field in the header up to and including the key data. Third message C from the authenticator to the supplicant. When message B is received by the authenticator, it is able to extract the value of S nonce because the message is unencrypted. The authenticator then has all the information to compute its copy of the temporal keys. After this is done, the pairwise key distribution is effectively completed. However, the remaining message exchanges messages C and D are used to ensure that the keys are put into effect in a synchronized way. Message C serves two functions. First, it verifies to the supplicant that the authenticator knows the PMK and is thus a trusted party. Second, it tells the supplicant that the authenticator is ready to install and start using the data encryption keys. The authenticator does not actually install the keys until it has received message D. Note that if a retransmission of message C is needed due to failure to get a response, the retransmission should be a copy of the original unencrypted transmission. Last transmission, D, from the supplicant to the authenticator. This final message verifies to the authenticator that the keys are about to be installed. There is nothing surprising or new in the setting for this message, which is similar to message B, but without the key data field. The secure bit is not set until the four-way handshake is successfully completed and both supplicant and authenticator have installed the keys. This does not happen until message D has been received and decoded successfully. WPA2 Enterprise addresses concerns in respect to distributing and managing static keys and controls access on a per-account basis by integrating most organizations' authentication services. Therefore, credentials like username and password, certificate or a one-time password are necessary to authenticate the client on the authentication server. The access point or wireless controller monitors the connection and redirects authentication packets to the appropriate authentication server, typically a RADIUS server. If the client is allowed to connect to the wireless network, the authentication server answers with an allow message to the access point 
and therefore the client is able to connect to the wireless network. To find out more about network security, see www.fp7-flamingo.eu, a network of excellence under its seventh framework program.